Jesus, we trust your word, and we trust that you're going to speak to us from it. I pray for each person in this service that you will guide us to a deeper understanding of your character, your nature, and of what it means for us to live lives in reflection of each. We ask this in your precious name. And everybody says, I open your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If, you, if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have not been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates the Father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the fathers, from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have seen with me from the beginning. Isaiah forty tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God will stand forever. The word hatred is so abstract to what who we are and to what most of our lives look like. We don't have a lot of things that we hate. Now, that's different for some of us. If I were to ask you what you hate, you would probably tell me a sports team that you hate. You may tell me of a, a place that you're not too fond of. We've tried to eliminate the word hate from being used by our children. Anyone else try to eliminate? We don't hate things. Uh, I asked Hope today if there was anything that she hated, and she adamantly said chicken and dumplings. I, I, I don't know. Uh, all right, I didn't know, okay, I knew she did not like them. I did not know that she had this vehement feeling towards chicken or dumpling. I am pro-chicken and dumpling, and so it confuses me. For us, hate's a very abstract concept, and it's a word that we use pretty regularly to describe things that, to describe the way that we feel in response to the world in which we live. But there are times that we use that word that we've not really thought of what it really means because in each and every one of us, there is also a desire to be accepted. And when we talk about what this passage teaches us today, it will say that we are hated. That we are hated by the world, which means for many of us, if we are to be hated by the world, there's really only one of two options. We are either completely engrossed in worldliness or we have received an inexplic inexplicable amount of grace from the point in regards to where we are in history that's never before been seen. We are either immersed in worldliness or we have received grace that has not been given to any other part of the church throughout history. That we would not be hated. Hated so abstract. It's a, when we look at the word abstract, let me just give you a definition of that word. The, the idea of abstract means this. It's a thought apart from concrete realities, specific objects, or actual instances. When we say that Christians are hated, is this concrete for us? My first experience with anything like this took place when I was in high school, my grandmother decided that I should go to visitation weekly at our church. At that time in history, the best way to do visitation was to, or they, everyone thought, was to go door to door, knock on doors, have conversations with people. And I remember on Tuesday nights, we would go and we would have dinner together with uh, our entire church family, and we would strategically plan what it would mean for us to go do door to door visitation. Somehow, in the midst of this, I started getting shoved in our pastor's car every week. That's high pressure sales for a kid, by the way. 16 years old, I'm riding with a pastor. So what I would do is I would 
walk behind him and just mumble a little bit every now and then if he gave me a chance. I remember one door in particular when we pulled up in his Volvo. That's true, he drove a Volvo. And he told me to get out. I said, what do you mean get out? Are you going to make me walk home? We live in East Lake. This is a mission trip area. We do not need to be dropping me on the side of the road. He sends me to the door to knock on the door. When I knock on the door, this man opens the door, and he sees that I've got my Bible in hand, which screamed, this guy's about to bug me at 6.45 in the afternoon. And when he saw the Bible was in my hand without a word from my mouth, he said, I don't believe any of that, and slammed the door in my face. And as a 16-year-old, I have been persecuted. And I go back to the car, and we drive back to the church, and I get a couple of sandwiches that were left over from dinner. That's the closest I came to actual persecution for my belief. As we look around the world today, there are many people who are very far from that being the tip of their persecution. There is persecution on a global basis. We, we look at the disciples here, and their day's just getting worse. It reminds me of the book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. I'm sure some of you have read that, possibly memorized it. Alexander wakes up. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard, and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running, and I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I think I might move to... Australia. So the idea of the disciples is that their day is just getting worse. They started out with Jesus, and he begins to let them know, this is about to go south. Your day is going to get worse and worse. We've been in chapters of their life getting worse so, 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 thus far. And what we see take place last week with, in regards to Jesus, where he says that I'm the vine, you're the branches, you're to love one another. They've been smacked in the face by the idea that their Messiah is about to depart. They've been smacked in the face with the idea that their Messiah is not going to be the Messiah that they expected. They have been told over and over, this is not going to go well for you. And now we're at the point where Jesus says, not only am I leaving and you're not going to get what you want, everyone around you is going to hate you. They're going to hate you. Who wants to hear that? Not me. Nobody likes to be told that, that they're hated. We, we look into the book. And we see here that Jesus sets up for us the reason for the hatred of the world. There's a precedent in the life of believers in regards to hatred. We see this in verse 6, 17 and 18. A precedent for hatred. These things I command you, verse 17 says, these things I command you so that you will love one another. Verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The word, every time I say it, I'm just shocked by how intense of a concept it portrays. In my mind, the world will hate you. And then I think about my life, and I ask myself, do I really feel like the world hates me? We look at it, uh, we see that everyone who hates the teachings of Jesus, that idea of everyone who hates or the world will hate, indicates that inward sin is just as problematic as outward action. John, not loving, for you not to, to not love someone means that you hate them. I think it's really, really unique because I've talked about the word love before and how we use the word love to describe everything. You love your mom, you love your dog, you love burritos. I don't know how your mom feels about the fact that you care about her the way you do about a burrito or a dog, but we use that word, and because we love everything, we don't really love anything. And I believe the same can be said for, her, for the word hate. When we talk about what it means to hate here, we have to be very careful to realize that it's not simply you not having an affection towards something. It means that there is a lack of an affection towards it. So apathy or disregard for something conveys to us, based on what John's gospel teaches, that there is hatred that is present. The world will hate you. So it's not simply that we are face-to-face, -face, persecuted, door slammed in our face, possibly chased, though that happens throughout the world chased and beaten for our faith the idea of a disregard for something that you claim matters so much to you so there's that side of the coin or there's the side of the coin that says that this really doesn't matter that much to you or to me it's either one or the other according to John 
You either love or you hate. You're either in or you're out. Note that, that not to love someone for John means that it basically he equates it in 1 John to being a murderer. Jesus says this in, in regard to on the Sermon on the Mount, that if you refer to your brother and call him, you, he uses the Aramaic word raka, which is fool, not in the Mr. T sense, but in the I hate you completely sense. When you use that word, you've committed murder in your mind and in your thoughts. The idea of disregard. We look and we see this. Not only do we have that people will be hated, that there's a precedent that's set because our Jesus is hated, we can look throughout the Bible and see this. Jesus chased throughout this book the gospel we that we've been reading through and the people hate him these who would have religious leadership these who would stand and set themselves up as those who were in control that because of that you are parted from the norm because of hatred verse 19 if you are of the world the world would love you as its own but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus referencing what we just looked at in verse six, in last week in verses 15, 16, and 17, that the world would set you apart, that he has set you apart. And because he has set you apart, literally reading, he has laid you down and laid you to the side. The hatred should be there. We look in First Peter. Uh, Peter, actually, he walked with Jesus. He was here for this story that Jesus is telling the disciples. In First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, he again talks about the separation that comes when you have believed in Jesus. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, that's the idea of set apart. This is what this gospel has done to you. To abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage against your verse ten, verse nine rather. Let's start back there. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. The constant idea in the life of believers is that Jesus has laid us to the side, that he has done a work to set us apart, and he sets us apart for something. You and I are set apart with cosmic intent, with divine intent. If we have trust in Jesus, faith in Jesus, if our hope is in Jesus, the idea of us being hated by the world is no surprise to Jesus because he's the one that set you apart from it. He is not shocked. He is not surprised that we would be hated, that there would be a disdain that comes for those who would call upon the name of Jesus. The idea of the world used in John's gospel, the word that's used there, it's you're separate from the cosmic system. What's been put into place, you're not part of. Are we part of that? If we're to evaluate ourselves and look at the way that our life walks alongside of every other life in the world in which we live, do we see that there is distinction and separation? Do we see that saying that we're going to declare the praises of Him who called us into a marvelous light means more than we lift our hands and spin around during a song? Do we see the idea of us being people who have been purchased by God, bought by the blood of Jesus, set apart for the sake of Jesus, that that means more for us? than simply being able to say, this is the system that I claim to, to believe in, but actually realize that that belief propels us into a world for the sake of the name of Jesus. You are sent out. I'm sent out. The idea of us being followers of Jesus who react and respond to who Jesus is means that what takes place in this room is not a platform-driven event where you listen to someone tell stories and you listen to someone sing songs and you walk out and your life is not changed. We gather together in corporate worship on a regular basis to celebrate the idea that God would do a unique, merciful work in us and as a result of that unique, merciful work, we walk into our world for the sake of the great name of Jesus and we realize in the midst of my discomfort and displeasure and in the midst of what I may view as persecution, God has not walked away. He's not walked away. Parted from the norm because of hatred. We see that. 
We see in verse 20, Remember the word I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. One Bible scholar says this about the word persecuted and the sense that's conveyed in this passage. It basically means to be chased like a wild beast. That's abstract. Again, an abstract concept. Because none of you this week and none of me have been chased like wild beasts for what I claim to believe about Jesus. I follow a lot of pastors on Twitter. That's kind of what happens when you're a pastor. And they use their voice, some of them, to speak to people who are in the world who are being persecuted for the sake of their faith. And the people who follow them, these pastors, they will retweet them. So if there's one pastor who is being persecuted in the Sudan Pastor A will reference that. He will have a heart for that. And then you see this retweet that comes. We know what a retweet is, right? Yes, we should shake our heads. 2013 people, you got to work with me. And as we look at that, here's what we realize. The people who follow that, they retweet them. And there are times as these things get retweeted, secondary, tertiary levels that eventually what is a real problem for someone, a crisis, is for us nothing more than a hashtag. The idea of persecution for the sake of the name of Jesus is historic and it's global and it's current. We look at church history, we see what Jesus says here. We look at what took place with Nero. We see persecution for those who would call upon the name of Jesus. We see persecution throughout the history of the church. And then I begin to think about this. That for many of us, missionaries around the world right now, they're being persecuted or they live in fear of persecution. If you have ever received an email from a missionary who is in a difficult place, I just want you to raise your hand. Anybody ever seen one of these? I mean, really, they talk in code. I feel like I should put on a vest and start decoding Wookiee. It is so hard to understand everything that they say because they're trying to cover their bases, trying to make sure that what takes place and what they say does not get their children kidnapped. It doesn't get their wife taken and tortured. It doesn't get them killed because they believe that living in the midst of that persecution, for them to live is Christ. But they trust that to die is gain. The idea that we would realize that persecution is so much more than someone not allowing us to wear a shirt to school or talk about something at work. It's a crisis globally. Now those things matter. The way we're treated, those matter. But let me encourage you with this thought. There are times that we struggle with real persecution because of our faith. And there are times that we feel like we're being persecuted because someone is responding to us being a jerk. Those are different concepts, different realities. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was tortured by the Nazis and eventually killed, talks about discipleship and allegiance to Jesus. And he says this, discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ. And it is therefore not at all surprising that the Christian should be called to suffer. Each and every one of us, there is a level of suffering that we are called to because we are in this world, but we're not of it, that we are part of something that is not our home. 21, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. And then Jesus begins to say, if, it had come, if I had not come and spoken to them, this is specifically to the Pharisees, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. The idea there is that there was a constant they were doing at one point. They were trusting that God would provide a Messiah. And he's saying the Messiah is here, and they've not trusted, so they're guilty. Now this, we have to read clear, clearly, based upon what Paul tells in the book of Romans, 
All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is a specific reference to the situation that comes with the Pharisees, that these men who had claimed historically to be trusting in the provision of God were really just trusting in what they could do. 23, whoever hates me hates my father. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, so he's talked about who he is, he's talking here about what he does, they would not be guilty. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated without a cause. They hated me and they had no reason to. When we talk about those moments that come for you where you feel like you're persecuted, I would encourage you to ask yourself, can I come back to this? that I am being disregarded, that I am being chastised, or whatever word you want to use, because I'm leery to use the word persecution about many of our situations. That those things are taking place without reason. We've got to wrestle with the idea of what does our what do what does what we do matter in regards to this? Influence. Have I influenced this? We also see this for believers as Jesus continues to encourage us. There is power in the face of hatred. And for you and for me there is power. Verse 26. But when the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So the helper's coming. Now, we've dealt with the helper a couple of weeks ago, but the idea of the helper is the presence of the Holy Spirit is there. And when he comes, he's going to bear witness about me. So that means for you and for me, as we walk in the face of difficulty, and as I pray, we embrace the idea of global persecution that's taking place for believers, that we'll realize this, that the helper of God, the Spirit of the living God. The truth of the Spirit of truth, Jesus says at one point. When we are spending time investing and abiding in Jesus, that He will speak to us and bear witness to this Jesus. And He will clarify for us when we are living in such a way that is honoring to God. And I pray for us as those who call ourselves believers that are for us when those moments comes when he bears witness to the idea that my behavior and that your behavior has dishonored God we will hear that we will hear that and realize that we are in the world but we're not of it that we are called to this world though we are not from it that this world that claims that they want more and more and more they need to see us trusting in less and less and less, that less eventually collapsing on one, and that is the person who is Jesus. The idea of us trusting in the Holy Spirit working in and through us and Him empowering us means that this book is something that you use more than when you show up on Sundays and pull it out of your car. Maybe for us, that, that means that we commit and we surrender to the idea that every time we have this app on our phone that we are just addicted to, and we're all addicted to something, that we promise ourselves that we're going to spend that much time looking into Scripture. I mean, people, let's be honest, you have the Bible accessible with you 24 hours a day. And for us to trust the Spirit is working in us and through us, we need to spend time in Scripture because what the Spirit does in us as we spend time in prayer is He affirms and confirms what Scripture teaches. What is Scripture teaching you about the nature and character of God? Because when Scripture teaches us about the nature and character of God, it has outward implications. And yes, you live in a world that hates you. A world that is, is far from you. A world that does not grasp why this would matter to you but I would encourage you to ask yourselves at times just because I come up show up here on Sunday morning does that really mean this matters to me or is this a habit because it's a bad habit we look at this passage and we see this that the spirit for us is power in the face of hatred and we also see this 
that the Spirit shows us how to practice in response to hatred. Verse 27 of this says, And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So you're going to bear witness. Because So this word from Jesus through John to us says that we're going to bear witness, which does not mean that we also bear witness. The Spirit does His thing and we do ours. It means that we are, as people who trust in Jesus, empowered by the Spirit to bear witness because He has made that possible. We see in Philippians chapter 2, Beginning in verse 12, just 12 and 13 reads this. There my, for my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and with trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So as we are people who are committed to the work of God in our lives through what his word says, through his spirit making himself known as we abide in Jesus, we realize that God is bearing witness through us. Where is the Spirit bearing witness in you? Where is the Spirit bearing witness through you? This is not, he does his thing and I do mine. John and uh, our former uh, minister of senior adults here, there was a time when they would go do hospital visits together. And when they would go, go do hospital visits together, they did not have a lot of time on their hands. They would show up at the hospital and they would split. And one of them would cover two rooms and one of them would cover three or vice versa. That's not the concept that this passage conveys to us about the Spirit bearing witness in us. That we show up and He does His thing and I do mine. The concept that we see in this passage is that as we go and do what we do, we are powerless apart from the Spirit bearing witness in us and through us for the sake of the name of Jesus. We look and we see this, that the Spirit of God, as He works in us, calls us to real situations and to bear witness to the real solution to the idea that a world in which we live would have hatred and apathy toward the things in the name of Jesus. The story of St. Patrick I read, very interesting. St. Patrick's Day is <coughs> not just about leprechauns, shamrocks, and green beer. The idea of what St. Patrick's Day is ultimately comes from a man who was in the 400s and he was born at 16 years old this guy was living in Britain was taken captive by Ireland at that point in history the Roman Empire it stopped at Great Britain did not extend into Ireland because that's where the barbarians were so this guy's taken captive and he is made to be a slave to barbarians for six years St. Patrick is a slave to these barbarians eventually he escapes I don't know how that works, but he escaped. He got away. He went back to Great Britain, and he spent the next 20 years pastoring a church, which seems like a good thing. But it didn't stop there. At the ripe old age of 48, and I say ripe old age because at that point in history, 48, you were getting a discount at Captain D's. 48 years old, he feels compelled by the Lord to go back to Ireland and bear witness to this Jesus who had saved him. Now let me be honest with you. He was not a Christian when he was taken captive. His dad was a deacon. His granddad was a leader in their church. When he was taken captive, all that he knew about the faith was a head knowledge. But in the midst of his slavery, there's a point for him where he comes to faith in Jesus. And he realizes as he is living as a slave that God is teaching him their dialect teaching him their customs because one day there's a possibility that he's going back for us as believers in Jesus there are moments for us where we have to realize that the spirit of God bears witness to the son for the sake of us realizing that we are to in unison surrender to where the Spirit is taking us and bear witness to the Son where are we declaring that Jesus is Lord where are we saying that in the face of our difficulty 
we will rejoice. Where are we looking at our lives and seeing that this Jesus really does matter? That the idea for us is that we would stand out and be separate. I don't know how many of you own a device called an iPhone. If you do, or if you've ever seen one, let me raise your hand. If you've ever heard of one, just join the rest of us. The iPhone is a very interesting device. It does lots of things. Like its primary function is still to be a telephone. I'll be honest with you. But besides that, you've got apps, and I think it like toast toast and makes bacon. But it comes and it is set on a certain ring, and no one ever changes the ring. So if you're at a restaurant and and the phone rings, you see 17 people look, who's calling me? How important am I? Let me answer my phone. You see everyone in the room scrambling because they're all united under one umbrella. But what we find is this, what takes place when the Spirit sets us apart is He changes what we're to hear. He changes how we are communicated with. The Spirit of God does a work in us to make things so different and honestly bizarre because when you hear a ring that's not that it's strange for us as believers I would pray that we're not having the same ring of the world in which we live we're not part of a cosmic system that's just spinning on top of spin because it's eventually going to collapse but that we as believers would hold fast and firm to the idea that this Jesus has done a work for the sake of something unique and different, that his setting us apart and possibly placing us in the face of suffering, in the midst of it, that him showing us there are people globally who are suffering, would remind us that the great God of the Bible has not ceased to work in the world In our world, there are numerous people, groups, who've never heard the name of Jesus. And based upon the words of Jesus, we are to tell them and make disciples of them. How are we encouraging in a world that hates us that Jesus should be made much of? Because the heart of the Bible over and over is that every tribe, tongue, and nation should confess and declare that this Jesus is magnificent. That specific, distinct, ring, we look and we see Jesus speaking to us as his people. We find this passage telling us that there are going to be moments where simply based on what you trust to be true, you will be ostracized. You will know of people who are being persecuted. Where our encouragement in that and our strength in that is found only in trusting in the Spirit that has already transformed us. Because it's not going to happen in your own resolve or in my own power. It happens as we lean in and abide in and we trust in this Jesus. Here's what I want us to do. This is going to be just a time of response. I'm going to ask the band to come up, and they're going to lead us in a song. And as they lead us, I want us to listen to the words and hear what they say and and allow them to to speak to us and speak over us. I want to encourage you to stand right now and to bow your heads. If you're here and you feel the need to spend some time in prayer, I say this weekly, if you need to pray or, or ask someone to pray with you, please do. For whatever reason, when they put the chairs out, they gave us plenty of space for that kind of thing today. We want to make sure that we are a people who are encouraging to one another, so I'm going to ask Tony Leonard, to be up here on my right-hand side. I'm going to ask Rick Glenn to be here on my left. Kevin Featherston, he's also one of our our deacons here. Bill Winchester, also a deacon. If there are any extra people that need prayer, you guys come and pray over them and pray for them. Maybe someone feels persecuted. Maybe someone feels like they've been ostracized or mistreated. And you would just say, hey, I don't know how to deal with this. Can you pray for me? Please do that. Please do that. Because we're not here to judge you. If you're here to judge somebody, you don't need to be here. God, we trust you today, and I pray that your word has spoken to us. Your spirit, God, I pray we were responding to it. Lord, in the midst of hatred, in the face of hatred, I pray that we realize that our strength is not in us, in our own ability, our own resolve, our own intention. But God, our resolve comes because you, Lord Jesus, 
have said, I've set you apart for this. So abide in me. Stay in me. Remain in me. So God, if there are those here this morning, for whatever reason, who do not feel as if they've remained in you, God, I pray you will break them, convict them, and show them, if they are believers, what it means to repent. If there are some in here, <coughs> according to each page of Scripture, tells that you're spiritually dead, that they're spiritually dead, I pray that they will place their trust in you, God. They'll realize that your spirit is beckoning them, that it's calling them, that they're not saved because they come to a building each week. Lord, their salvation is found because the spirit of the living God has worked in them for the sake of your great name. We are saved for something. We are sent out with a purpose. God, let us embrace what you've done in us. And if persecution comes, God, let us trust your strength in the face of it. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Feel free to sing as we sing or move as God leads you to move.